Hello, and thank you for stopping by. Today's subjects are what movies are made of, because these guys were at one time stars in the bank robbing field before taking an eventual darker turn. I don't mean to glorify anyone, but they like the action as much as Bruce Willis, and that's what makes the reputation of the Boyd Gang stand out historically in the world of stick-up men. The Boyd Gang loved money, they loved robbing, and they loved having a generally good time by their standards. Their name was derived from the media's love for the Hollywood-looking fearless and always eager Edwin Alonzo Boyd, who was proclaimed as their leader. However, it's said that the brainiac and organizing factor was in fact another member of the gang named Lenny Jackson. I couldn't help but feel like it was rightfully named after Boyd himself. You'll see why. Aside from Lenny and Edwin, the gang also included a man named Valent Lesso, who went by the alias of Steve as well as another gentleman named Willie Jackson, who had no relation whatsoever to Lenny. I want to clear that up from the get-go. From what I could find, these guys originally met in the Don Jailhouse, which is in Canada, in the year 1951. I ask that you bear with me as I could not find details for every single robbery, but we will certainly dive into their most notorious robberies as these guys were running rampant during the middle of the 20th century. Anyways, Edwin Boyd was from Canada. Born in 1914 and ironically, his father wound up working for the Toronto Police Department. While in school, Edwin kept himself busy with after-school activities and music and band, though he never really excelled from an academic standpoint. By 1933, he was arrested for the first time, leading to a short stint in jail, and in 1936, he attempted to rob a store, but he failed. He soon was enlisted into the Royal Canadian Regiment, which is a branch of their army. While stationed overseas, he met his eventual wife, Doreen Mary Frances Thompson, who had a secret first child that she hid from Edwin in the beginning. Edwin, though, came to adopt her first child after he was introduced. Then, they had a child together almost a year later, but tragically, they lost their newborn son during an air raid that critically injured their infant. Soon after, Edwin Boyd transferred over to the Canadian Provost Corps in 1942 before successfully having twins with his wife a year later. Finally, in 1945, he was discharged from the service after the war ended. By the late 1940s, Edwin Boyd and his wife were back living in Canada where Boyd struggled to find a good job to provide for his wife and young children. Ultimately, Edwin Alonzo Boyd decided that by any means necessary, he was going to put food on the table for his family even if that meant turning to crime. On September 9th, 1949, he made a decision that you can't come back from, a decision that could potentially lead to multiple convictions and a long sentence behind bars. That decision was to rob a bank, and that bank was a branch of the Bank of Montreal for a grand total of $2,256, which was by no means chump change back in the 1940s. See, he was pretty confident in his robbing skills because of his military and motorcycle riding experience. He considered himself someone who enjoyed indulging in more adrenaline-driven activities, so bank robbing was going to be right up his alley. In hindsight, he had just fought in one of the largest world wars in history. He had already suffered horrible and personal tragedies, so in a sense, he probably felt things could obviously be much worse than the potential of being arrested, so to him... The risk was probably worth it. As tough as he was, he still decided to have a couple of alcoholic beverages before partaking in his first robbery because he had the first time jitters. So, a little buzzed, he walked into the bank, pulled out his Luger from the war after handing over a note declaring that this was in fact a good old fashioned stick up. As he was running out of the bank of Montreal, the manager began a foot pursuit after Edwin, but he got away. And by the time the police were passing by him, he had discarded his simple disguise of makeup. Then in 1950, Edwin wound up on the stroll again looking for a new bank to rob, this time with more prior effort and planning. Hoping things would go smooth from start to finish, from stick up to getaway. This time his victim was a branch of the Canadian Bank of Commerce. He followed the same procedure of robbery though, simply handing over a note as he brandished his prized German Luger. Now adding a little bit more of his own antics, jumping on the counter, being a little bit more demanding. His total cash break was a little more than the last haul at a total of $2,862. Dollars. 
After a couple successful robberies, he reluctantly told his wife, but she was accepting of it. And by the middle of the year, he saddled up and robbed the Dominion Bank for a little of over $2,000. Later that year, he wound up trying to rob another bank in North York, but the bank manager intervened and got hold of his gun. Edwin Boyd had to charge that attempt to the game as he got away with nothing, not a single dollar. In fact, he was lucky to escape with his life because the bank manager turned into Dirty Harry and started ringing off shots at Edwin after he wrestled away possession of the pistol. Barely a year later, after he originally started his bank robbing spree, he returned to the scene of his first major crime. He returned to the Bank of Montreal to rob it once again. After a while, he met a degenerate alcoholic named Howard Galt. They became friends. Together, along with his younger brother Norman Boyd, the three went and robbed another bank for a total close to $10,000. And obviously during that era, that was a nice cash grab. Unfortunately for Edwin, Howard was not built with the same composure that Edwin was, and Edwin was about to fall victim to the incompetent of Mr. Goat. They decided to rob yet another bank, and after settling without a serious plan in place, they ran in and to the surprise of Edwin, Howard started going crazy. He became erratic, and by the time Edwin had convinced Howard to flee, the police were on the way. Edwin was able to escape at first, but Howard was snatched up like a puppy by its neck and started barking off details about his former friend Edwin Boyd. Edwin was soon arrested and confessed to his part in multiple robberies. He was sent to the Dawn Jail, which was a notorious and dangerous Canadian detention center before it was closed in 1977. While in jail, Edwin Alonzo met Lenny and Willie, both whom were violent thieves themselves. Almost instantly, they began trading stories one important detail about Lenny was that Lenny had a fake false foot which he would store saw blades inside of. A little bit of context for later. The three decided they should break out of jail together and on November 4th, 1951, they set their plan in motion, sawed out some window bars and scaled down the side. Their plan involved them being picked up by the earlier mentioned Steve, but he was nowhere to be found before ultimately showing up late. It didn't take long for the convicts to plan and execute a couple of bank robberies, one a Bank of Toronto and the other one a Leaside Royal Bank. However, the police were looking for them already for their escape and had assumed it was them that had committed the above mentioned two robberies. It is important to note that the gang as a whole, they did not like each other. There was jealousy. Most of the guys seemed to have a superiority complex in one way or another. They all cared about their reputations, both personally and in the description the media was displaying about them. Willie was eventually arrested, but he kept his mouth shut. Afterwards, Willie had a younger brother who joined up with the gang, and his name was Joe. The gang was now mainly Edwin, Steve, and the younger brother of Willie. They robbed a bank together. Then they robbed another bank, this time with Steve's girlfriend, a woman named Mary. What they didn't know, though, was that Mary was a snitch, even though she was related to Lenny. She was informing to the police. She told the police about their getaway car, which belonged to the mother of Steve's child, the true love of Steve's life, a woman named Anna. On a fateful day, Lenny and Steve were driving, and tragically, because of the information that Mary had shared with the police, a Detective Tong and Sergeant Perry were patrolling the streets when they spotted the supposed getaway car. They pulled them over, and as Detective Tong approached the black car, shots were fired from the car, striking Tong in the chest, critically injuring him and striking Perry in his arm. The thieves got away, and the policemen were rushed to the hospital, where Tong sadly passed away. After fleeing, Mary tipped off the police about Steve. The police raided Steve's apartment and shot him, but it wasn't fatal. Lenny was also found in an apartment, but Lenny got into a shootout with police. They wounded Lenny multiple times before his pregnant wife talked him into surrendering. Finally, a detective with known integrity, Adolphus Payne, set his sights on the last known member of the Boyd gang, Edwin himself. Through grimy and time-consuming detective work, Adolphus Payne was able to discover a vehicle that was transferred to Edwin Boyd's wife from Norman, unwittingly. Norman and his wife were attempting to sell the car, and as fate would have it, the detective called the ad for the car and wound up speaking to Norman. The police said they were interested in purchasing the car, 
so they said they would only purchase it from the original owner of the car, that being Edwin's wife, Doreen. So Doreen came over, got a fake check that was setting up the plan so they could get to Edwin. And it was successful as Doreen went and picked up Edwin afterwards and the police surveilled them. They found where Edwin was being harbored and on March 15, 1952, the police raided the house during the early morning hours. Edwin was arrested without any violent altercations. The whole gang was now convicted, including good old Mary the Singing Canary, as her snitching didn't give her immunity. By the order of their justice system, the original members of the gang were in prison together again. The whole gang was back together, you could say. Edwin, Lenny, Steve, and Willie. To nobody's surprise, they followed the same historical road as before and planned an intricate prison break. This time, on September 8th, 1952, the gang escaped and forged into the Don Valley. And for a little context, the guards did take Lenny's fake foot this time, so he had to run through the wilderness with a cup over his stump. He really was tough and persistent, though I'll give him that. Somehow or another, Steve left the gang for a bit and came back with a new foot for Lenny. And I... Listen, if, if you could go and find a false foot for your friend in that time period, I mean, hell, even in this time period, hey, you're a great friend. So let's give Steve some kudos. Anyways, he brought Lenny his new foot, and then he brought some weapons and new clothes for everyone. But as luck would have it, some farmers saw them tracking and mistook them for homeless people and reported them out of suspicion. The police showed up to a barn, and without alarming the criminals caught them without any more further violence. They were immediately put on trial, and by the end of 1952, Lenny and Steve were hanged over the death of Detective Tong. Edwin was eventually released for good behavior in 1966. Before his death in 2002, Edwin confessed sadly that he had killed two people before robbing banks, but the police couldn't get an investigation done before his passing. I hope you all enjoyed this story. I truly hope that the victims of their crimes found peace. I also want to clarify that I would never glorify the actions of criminals, but their story is exactly what you would typically want from a good bank robbing movie. Sadly, this wasn't film or fiction and people lost their lives. Thank you for stopping by, and if you could, please like, subscribe, come back, and have a wonderful rest of your day.